What's up, H-Town? Welcome to the Believe in Astros podcast, your home for all things Astros, with your hosts, sports writer Jeff Balky and Astros broadcaster and former third baseman Jeff Blob. Now, here's Balky and Blubber. What is up, Astros fans? Welcome to episode 68 of the Believe in Astros podcast on the Believe Podcasting Network. I'm Jeff Balky alongside my partner, Jeff Blum, who's back from the longest roadie of the season. And that's a that's a long road trip, Blummer. It was, it was a long one. We left uh, early on or late on a Wednesday. We had an off day in Seattle, then an off day in Chicago. So when you include those two off days into a nine game trip, yeah, it, it extends it a little bit. We've got two more uh, this season. Are they that long? Are the other two this this year that yeah, long? Or are they? Let's they're see. pretty close, right? Yeah, they're extremely close, and they actually might be longer because uh, really? the I end of June. Yeah, the end of June, we've got a uh, day off on June 22nd, three games in L.A. It looks like an off day in St. Louis for three days, and then a four-game series in Texas to finish off that road trip. Oh, God. Four days in Dallas. God yeah. bless you. When is, well, that, when is that June? What What's the date on that? <clears throat> uh, June 22nd to July 3rd. Oh, man. Holy yeah. moly. I and then you come, come to- out of the All-Star break with another – what three, four, five, uh, nine game trip on the West Coast? <laughs> Holy Lord! I may come yeah. up to that. I may come up to that Dallas game. I may come up there and see that. See Mimic May do Park it. for myself. Break up the monotony for me. I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm doing that. Hey, I'll take you to my uh, cousin's I was restaurant. Say the we'll yeah, hit, be, damn well better. Yeah, we'll hit that restaurant. That, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do that. It's good. I'm putting yeah, that on the calendar pay right your now. your friendship dues. <laughs> that's exactly right. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I know more birthdays, obviously, but I, I'd be remiss in not mentioning the fact that this Thursday is my father-in-law, Alan Matisseau's 86th. And, oh, you know, he is a massive, massive baseball fan. And my my good friend, Katya Horner, who's a huge friend of the show and is always sending me cool stats and has been an Astros fan forever, her birthday's Saturday. So a lot of good birthdays in the, Happy in the birthday few weeks here. Yeah, absolutely. Also, I'm wearing my Rockets hat today because today is, hashtag, today is hashtag pray for Victor. The draft lotto <laughs> is tonight <laughs> to decide who is going to draft the unicorn Victor Wimbiana. We'll see. Uh, how's it going this morning, Blummer? Are you glad to be home? Always glad to be home. Yeah. Laundry day yesterday was uh, <laughs> excessive, but uh, <laughs> eventually bet. got done. And it's a, t- it's a two-person show, too. I get it. I usually get it started and leave. And uh, <laughs> my wife, as gracious and amazing as she is, gets it done for me. So when I came home, I had a closet full of, of, of clean clothes, and the suitcases nice. were away, and it felt like home. Nice. My wife and I yeah. are very good about splitting duties uh, with things. We all we each have our things that we hate, and we each have our things that we're more than happy to do. So we we're pretty good about dividing those things. That's what you got to do if you if you're in a healthy relationship. You got to divide and conquer. Yes. Yes, appreciate that very much. So that's awesome. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, you can find us on Spotify, Apple, Stitcher, and of course YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe to keep up with us. Follow us on Twitter at Believe in Astros. Also on Instagram, you can find me at Jeff Balky Blummer at Blummer twenty seven all over the place. And you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, Got to be alerted to those new videos. There's always something of interest for everybody on that thing. Um, thanks to everyone who's given us five stars and left reviews on Apple. Please continue to do so. Um, I'm not saying, <clears throat> again, that you create fake emails for this. I'm just saying go ahead and create a fake email. That's what I'm, yeah. I'm asking you to do. It's it's circumventing the system, but you know sometimes you got to game things. That's all I'm saying. And uh, <laughs> please keep sending us comments and questions. Got a couple today um, that I'll we'll dig into in a bit. But our, my question for the day is, was that side eye from Aaron Judge anything? <laughs> Ah, jeez, man. Did you catch I, that? This is the world of conspiracy yeah. theories in which we live, Blummer. Yeah, and I mean, and, and now we have cameras everywhere. And I, you know, yes. I remember back in 2017, I believe it was the ALCS uh, mm-hmm. against the Yankees, and the you know Aaron Judge had that piece of paper. He was showing somebody in the dugout, and quickly the camera pans to the dugout, and he's like, "Oh right. my god!" He turns away, you know. So. <laughs> There, you just mentioned it, gamesmanship, you know, the multiple That's emails it. or the multiple peaks, whatever it is. Um, yeah. The only thing 
that I can say about that, you know, I don't know where he was looking. I honestly have no idea, but I know that, um, it was on the catcher when I, you know, I always do it. I have that voice where I go back in my day, we used to, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, if, if somebody, if, if the catcher catchers were usually keen to that, they, you know, every once in a while when they were before pitch come, they'd put their hand in their crotch, give the sign to the pitcher, and then they'd kind of peek up at the hitter to make sure that the hitter wasn't peeking at them. But now that you have pitch come, I'm kind of like, what is he looking at? Why is he looking? And the only thing would be, you know, I don't know. Somebody said something from the dugout and he kind of glanced over, but how are they getting this? You know, how is anybody getting the signs these days? The only thing you can pick up is location. You know, if the catcher sets up early enough. So I don't know. I mean, is there something there? I don't know. I have no idea. I'm not a bit. I'm just, you know me, man. I'm not a fan of conspiracy theories as a general rule. And frankly, if he looks over at the dugout, what do I care? You know, like if the ultimately now in fairness, he did hit a home run during that at bat. Mm-hmm. But I mean, listen, man, we're all, everybody's trying to get an edge, right? Yeah. And as much as I dislike the Yankees, well, whatever, you know? I mean, and honestly, they, were, they were using the center field camera from the Yes yeah. Network before the Astros were doing anything. That's so right. Whatever. And remember the the whole, like, was it the iPad scandal and or iPhones or whatever the hell it was? Uh, the, the Apple score. Watch from Boston. Apple Watch. Apple Watch in Boston. There you go. Well, mm-hmm. Whatever. Sometimes people, you know, look, sometimes you get caught and sometimes you don't. And that's just part of the, it's just part of the way. Sometimes you get scapegoated, whatever. Correct. That is correct. Thank you, John we know, Boy. We know the Yankees aren't going to get popped for anything. No, of course not. I mean, what they, again, who cares? Just let them. Who cares? Let, well, you know, what do you, what is, you always say, Blummer? What is it? Let the kids be kids, man. <laughs> that's what it is. Hey, yes, before we play the game. <laughs> that's right. Play the game. So before we dig in too much, I want to tell you a kind of a weird story. So I bought an e-bike for myself. Now, an electric bike, I have a great mountain bike. I love to ride it. But I wanted something where I could commute a little bit for like groceries and go to the gym and, you know, something where I wasn't going to like totally wear myself out on a 20 mile round trip. Um, and it's been great. I love it. Shout out to uh, Pedigo and the Heights. They're awesome. But when I bought this bike, I got a deal on it because they lent it out to police officers to ride in parades. And so they gave Uh me this incredible deal on it because it had, you know, maybe 150 miles already on it or something. But here's the weird part. The battery for this thing is signed by Craig Biggio. Now, I do not huh? know why the battery was signed by Craig Biggio, but apparently he is a big customer of theirs. Like, he's bought a number of bikes from them. What? And for some reason, he signed the battery to my e- – so I'm riding around on this bike now. Dude, I'm in eBaying Houston. that in 30 seconds, man. <laughs> I know. That's the first <laughs> thing I thought was, man, maybe I could get something for this battery for an e-bike. There's somebody um, out there that will overpay for that. I guarantee so, it. So, so I'm rolling around Houston on my e-bike with my Craig Biggio autograph battery. Anyway, it's just very, I just thought it was so bizarre that I'm like a Biggio signed my, all right. I feel yeah, maybe we gotta, should just you get to call it your, call it your biggie bike. <laughs> we should just get Bidge on the show just to talk about that. That should be yeah. his only conversation. Never mind Explain baseball. This. Let's talk about your e-bike autograph. Mm-hmm. Anyway, okay. I want to know. Moving on, a pretty uncharacteristic outing from Fromber last night. The dude could not hit the strike zone. Did you see anything <laughs> odd in his delivery or like what? Did you see anything? No, it, he just looked, he looked fatigued from pitch, from pitch one, just for me personally. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first pitch of the game, he was wiping sweat off his brow. I don't know. She, I don't know. You know, I, it, it was just an oddity. And uh, the, the most obvious thing and, you know, me being a color analyst on the broadcast, I cannot stand up there in with my headset on and expect to retain any form of dignity by saying, oh, it's because he's not wearing his blue jersey. Oh, I know. <laughs> so so I everybody know, on Come social on. media, I appreciate you pointing that out, <laughs> but I can't stand there and go, well, TK, it's because he does not have the standard blue jersey that he likes to wear. You know, it's it, it, there's there, there's other factors in there. I know, blue, affects, I know, guys are superstitious and all, but come on, yeah, right. <laughs> and you know what's crazy is that the two two the two non quality starts he has this season. One was the uh, Space City uniform last night. The other was the uh, opening day gold jersey of the gold that he jerseys. had to wear. 
So, you know, conspiracy theories run with that. <laughs> but as far as actual analysis, I cannot use that. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, the, the sinker wasn't uh, running. It ran, you know, the one home run he gave up was a cutter that flattened out and a couple of uh, double the other way to Patrick Wisdom. It was just a two seamer that ran back over the middle part of the plate. Mm -hmm. So, to your point, you make a great point that the command wasn't there because he was off the plate, but when he was on the plate, he actually got hit around a little bit because the mistakes were out over the plate. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it was one of the more odd stat lines I've seen because, yeah, he got hit hard, but he still had eight strikeouts in, what, four, right. four and a two-thirds or four and a third, yeah. whatever it was. I was like, dang, so he still had the swing and miss stuff, but the timing of the hits was terrible, and uh, the slug number was actually pretty high against him in that game yesterday against the Cubs. It just seems like he caught too much of the plate when he did. Yeah. And when exactly. he didn't, he was just off. I mean, he still had good movement on his fastball. You know, this was that arm side movement he gets. Mm -hmm. is, he gets a lot on that. He gets thing. a ton of it, man. And he's throwing I mean, hard, you know. Yeah. yeah. It's not exactly a sweeper, <laughs> which is no. the new all the rage yeah, sweeper, now. No sweeping. Yeah. It's. Uh, <laughs> um, but, but what was crazy to me? Oh, man. I had a thought in my head and it completely blacked out. <laughs> Welcome to 9 a.m. in the morning. Yeah, no kidding. It got me good right there. So swing and miss. I'm 0 for 1. <laughs> well, so the bullpen, as usual, was lights out, including Rafael Mantero, who has followed with some struggles. I mean, the guy has, has been. Thank you a for Jeremy off. Pena. Yeah, I was going to say, man, I still gave up hard contact, but Jeremy Pena with just the lights out defensive play of the night. Um, but, you know, and I feel like that's the kind of thing that Mike could get him feeling a little bit better you know he gets the, it gets a oh, clean yeah. inning you know so you just i'm sure it's he said you know after his last outing that he was he was throwing his pitches he was just catching too much of the zone and um yeah you would think with a guy like montero that he's not i mean he's you know throwing 95 96 but he's not throwing 99 like stanick did last night almost mm -hmm. blowing a hundo on occasion um Dude. so you just i don't think he can just blow by guys so he's got to locate and when he locates like, he really does a good job, but when he does locate, he can dot a corner as good mm -hmm. as good as anybody. But, you know, uh, yeah, thanks to Jeremy Pena for saving that. And the rest of the bullpen, just as usual, just, you know, lights out. Yeah, you know what's cool is uh, I actually thought Phil Maton was going to come in for a, for another mm -hmm. inning, but uh, he threw one inning, gave it to Seth Martinez. How good has Seth Martinez looked, by the way? His last right. five or six outings, yeah, I believe, have been scoreless. He kind of it looks like he's made a little bit of an adjustment to that delivery, mm -hmm. and the ball's coming out of his hand a lot better. And uh, like you said, Stanek looked amazing. Naris has been pitching really well too. His numbers continue say. to drop. And, uh, you know, I want to, you know, there was a great article in The Athletic talking about Rafael Montero because his yes. peripherals are actually better than the actual numbers. Now, I know that, you know, you're getting paid and judged on your actual production and your actual right. numbers. But if you go, you can actually see if a guy is pitching into bad luck or not. And, you know, the expected batting average against Montero is incredibly low. I think around 215. The expected slugging is very low against him. Mm -hmm. Yet the actual numbers are extremely high because of the soft contact. So his ERA at six and a half, he, he probably has a FIP, I think, around three and a half. So mm -hmm. there's a big difference in that. And eventually by the end of the season, and you hope that evens out. But a lot of it's because of the soft contact, yeah. bad luck, ball finding a hole. But last night, he got some good luck in having Jeremy Pena make a good play behind him. Mm. And uh, what a luxury for Dusty Baker. You know, on a night where he expected Fromber Valdez to go his, you know, his standard six to seven innings, he, he got good coverage from five guys out of that bullpen who did a great job without, yeah. without their two best relievers, I believe, in Abreu and Presley. I thought it was a great game. Good team win. It was a very good team win. We're going to dig in a little bit into the, the, the pitching numbers here in a minute. I've got some interesting stats on that, but um, we could call Jeremy Pena. It's a blue star play, Blummer. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we'll give him a blue star on that one. Um, Jose Abreu, speaking of maybe turning a quarter, he had a double, a single, a walk last time. He was on base three times. Some slug. We, we got a slug we, number. I know. Unbelievable. Can we glean anything from this? I mean, I just, you know, I just can't believe that Jose Abreu is going to go an entire season, you know, hitting this poorly, slugging this poorly. I mean, the whole team's kind of doing it, but I just can't imagine he's going to do that. 
<laughs> no, you can't imagine he can do that. He's going to do that because his track record is so good. And you just hope that, uh, you know, even with an age regression, he should still be a very good hitter because he's just a talented baseball player. Now, at, at the same time, we haven't seen him turn on a baseball. So I was kind of uh, fascinated that he actually pulled that double to the left, left center field side. Mm-hmm. So maybe that's a sign of things to come. And uh, the one thing that really shocked me is uh, the Chandler Rome tweet. That said that he has a he has one home run in his last four hundred plate appearances. That's that's a little that's a staggering number because that's, that's just huge. over a half season for some of these guys. Wow, I didn't see that. I, I that's an, that is an incredible number. Yeah, that one um, like stunned me because I'm sitting, you know, I'm watching a Bray. He's trying, he's fighting, he's making adjustments, he's doing things, and he's got, you know, uh, you know, he's fifth or sixth in uh, career home runs for the Chicago White Sox organization. Yet Chandler dropped that bomb, and I went, oh, oh, yikes! <laughs> that is a that is a oof, that's a painful stat. That's not a good one. I don't care for that no. one at all. Although another and good news. Yiner Diaz with his first big league homer, and he gets the silent treatment in the dugout. Did you ever get the silent treatment, Blummer? No, I wasn't cool enough. Nobody cared about me. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> no, that, no, that, that, that was – no, I never did, but that was one of the more – because we saw that happen to Altuve mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Yeah. When I, you know, it took him 100 bats at bats to hit his first home right. run. But um, with Yiner Diaz, that was so well executed top to bottom that you – how do you not enjoy that? That was fascinating. It was enjoyable. <laughs> I laughed uh, wholeheartedly at that, and me I thought too. that was really well done. It was a lot of fun to watch it was super fun to watch and just hey, what a great moment for that kid too to be able to go out and i say He'll kid, never forget that no that's it's 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 so great when you're when you're recognized by your teammates in that way mm-hmm. and they 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 recognize how important that moment is and that was just super cool also is jp france for real i mean yeah what, i mean is he what is i mean what is going on with fu manchu like <laughs> yeah Fu Man uh, strikeout. He his fastball plays. It, there, you know, there's right. something going on, and you know, the more he pitches, the more data we're going to get, and the more we're going to be able to unpack mm-hmm. what he's actually able to go out and do. But you know, 93 to 94 seems to play, and maybe he's one of those guys that has that late life on his fastball, like a Christian mm-hmm. Javier. But you know, this guy's going out and. Never underestimate the guy who's grinding away for six to eight years in the minor leagues. You right. know, these guys create – the reason they stick around is because they adjust, they adapt, they they, they grind. Um, but for whatever reason, J.P. France has gone out there and kind of – you know, he's kind of manipulated that strike zone and worked extremely hard to uh, have two very, very good starts to start his big league career. Yeah, it's it's been kind of remarkable that he's been sort of able he's able to hold it down. Brian, you know, uh, Brandon Belak had a good outing. Um, this is kind of what the Astros have to have right now. Uh, that and their bullpen, you know, while they're waiting around for guys. No, you need to, some guys to hold hold their ground a little bit. But I think what Belak and uh, JP France have done is done more than hold their ground. They've actually kind of given you some sense that, oh damn! Even though July thirty first is coming, what if we can hold down the hold down the place for a little while until uh, some of these guys get healthy? I don't know, man, because you know Lance McCullers is going to be hopefully coming back here uh, relatively soon because his arm looks good in some of the yeah. video that I've seen. But uh, there's some, these guys have pitched themselves into viable options that maybe kind of take your hand away from that panic button a little bit for the time right. being. And I give them credit, too. You know, you talk about timing in, uh, timing in baseball and who you're matching up against. They have matched up against, uh, you know, the Seattle Mariners and the Chicago White Sox in those two starts. Those are two teams that are struggling offensively, and they've yeah. taken advantage of it. So you got to give them credit in that sense for taking advantage of a key, key opportunities. Well, yeah, you still have to make your pitches, right? Absolutely. I mean, you still, still big league hitters, man. I don't care what anybody says. Yeah, you got to get up there and make your pitches, and that's just how it is. So, Jose Altuve, a couple of uh, re- a couple of rehab starts at Sugarland, sold out nights for Sugarland. Good for the Space Cowboys. <laughs> now, a couple of rehab starts in Corpus, back to uh, old stomping grounds, I would imagine. Um, oh yeah, and at uh, Whataburger Field down there. Um, I got to get down to a hooks game, man. I just got to get down. That's there a great that stadium. I rehab there for uh, for a couple of games, and I I had a blast. It was a yeah, great I get, spot. 
I got to get down there. Um, so here's the thing. He should be back next week. I mean, I don't think there's any reason to think that he's not going to be back, <laughs> which is remarkable and, ama- and fantastic. <laughs> <It's> crazy. <laughs> you know, but what do we know about what's going on with Michael Brantley? Like the whole thing uh-huh. about it's like it's not a setback, but we're shutting him down and he's not hitting. Like what's going on? Do we know? Um, I wish I knew. You know, I'm not in that training room. I'm not in the meetings. I, I'm not Michael Brantley, obviously. Um, you know, I know he's – you can see the disappointment when he's talking about it because he wants yeah. to be back playing too. Uh, but I have no idea. You know, you go through this process of rehabbing and it just takes maybe one swing or a an awkward move and all of a sudden you've got uh, swelling, inflammation, or you tweak it and you just don't feel right. So I don't know what's going on, but I know that uh, it's disappointing for us. It's disappointing for him. Yeah. But, uh, again, at the same time, these – you know, in these situations, when you have that kind of surgery, you have a tendency to err on the side of caution. And maybe yeah. that's what this is and just let it settle down a little bit and he'll get back out there swinging again. But, you know, when when he comes, when he gets healthy enough to get back on the field, I would imagine that rehab window is going to be a little bit smaller than it was previously where he was out there for two, three weeks getting hit, you know, getting at bats. Yeah. I think it's going to be a little bit more brief than that. It's just going to go out there make sure it's right, make sure it's not swelling up or inflaming or whatever the you know the comment was and then he'll get back on the big league team i don't think it's going to be as extensive yeah i think you're probably right we'll just have to see i like you said i i kind of tend to think with things like this they do just sometimes it's just like listen he got a tiny little uh there's something weird in his shoulder so let's just hold on everybody take it easy you know what i mean Mm -hmm. and uh i i can see where that would uh where that would be an issue um, and might just shut him down a little bit. We, we it's, but the thing is, we, the Astros really do need him back. So Channel yes, Rome, t- Channel Rome <laughs> tweeted this out, and this was the Astros are slashing two thirty eight, three oh eight, and three sixty four. This is after thirty nine games, and their their OPS is six seventy two, which is twenty eighth in baseball. Last and, I checked, there's only 30 teams in the big leagues. Exactly. They're, and their slugging percentage, 364, is 27th. Another friend of the show, Greg Cartlett, pointed out to me this morning on Twitter that the overall team OPS right now is lower than it was during the 300 loss seasons. Ah, ow, ow. So, I mean, what ow. the he- I mean, Thank I God never, for pitching. <laughs> I, well, that's and yeah, we'll we'll talk about that. What it like? What is this collective thing that happens with baseball teams? It's so confusing to me, and I'm and I know a lot of fans. I've talked to people who are like, "Why is it that all of a sudden, you know, everybody mm-hmm. just can't hit? Like, what is that?" Is well, hitting is contagious, much like a lot of things, but at the mm-hmm. same time. I want to ask you: Is it is it collective? Is is the slugging for the Astros? Is it collective? Because Jordan is slugging five sixty seven, mm-hmm. Kyle Tucker at four thirty one, you've got Jeremy <clears throat> Pena at four twenty seven, Chaz at four forty two. Those are your leaders as far as slugging is concerned. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mauricio Dubon is at 372. And then you scroll down to an Alex Bregman who's at 346. So, you know, my, I'm not trying to throw these guys under the bus, complain, no, make rag, a good point. None, of, none of this. It's th- There's two guys that are expected to slug and are slugging. Those That's Kyle Tucker and Jordan Alvarez. The other guys you expect to slug are not. So I'm I'm kind of in the camp of it's not a team wide thing. There is a handful of or you're an all star. You're expected to produce. You've got the contracts. Your corner guys are expected to go out there and slug, and they're not. Yeah. Your corner guys in the outfield are. Your left fielder and right fielder are doing all of the damage, a majority of it. And then you're seeing uh, Jeremy Pena with flashes of doubles and power. He's got that. 
but you're not seeing that consistent uh, slug number from your corner infielders in Abreu and Bregman, mm -hmm. and then you are missing a Jose Altuve. You are missing a, a Michael Brantley. So that's where I think the discrepancy is because I'm not expecting, you know, Chaz is putting up good numbers. Jake Myers has taken great at bats and great mm -hmm. swings, but those aren't guys I'm expecting. I'm not expecting Martin Maldonado, Jake Myers, Chaz McCormick, or Mauricio Dubon to go out there and do damage. But there are certain guys that we do expect that just aren't producing right now unfortunately and maybe they do you know maybe you know it turns around Bregman hits a home run last night Abreu hits a double maybe these things start to snowball and they you know like crack the code of their swing and all of a sudden they're off and being a juggernaut and those numbers start to jump yeah that's a really good point Blummer that there are guys who are her doing fine and then there are other guys who are doing i think that might be part of it is there's a lot of above average guys there's a few a handful of above average guys yeah, and there's a some bunch separation of, yeah yeah and a bunch of below average guys and that'll definitely it'll you know it breaks the curve <laughs> you know like in, yeah. you know it's a curve buster for sure um and especially with jordan too because jordan is so far and away so good this year. I mean, we don't listen. It's weird. It's a little weird that we don't really spend much time on here talking about Jordan, but also he's so good and it's such a given that what do you even say? You're just like, yeah, well, it's, I've run I out mean, of things to describe him. I don't it's know. just, there's no way to describe him other than say he's just incredible. And yeah. I, you know, whenever there's a great player like him, and I said this about Justin Verlander and I've said it about other players before, don't, sleep on that if you're a fan, right? Um, I remember mm -hmm. uh, growing up and watching Hakeem Olajuwon play from college all the way through the pros and watching Craig Biggio and Jeff Bagwell play and seeing Nolan Ryan pitch, you know, <clears throat> and watching, you know, Dr. J in basketball and seeing like just incredible players one after the other. You don't want to sleep on that stuff because it's very fleeting, <laughs> It goes real quick. And before you know it, these guys are not going to be out there doing this anymore. And then you're going to be like, man, remember when Cesar Sedania was so great? Or remember, oh, you know, man. Yeah. like back in my day, you know, exactly right. Unfold yeah, that out. Appreciate it. Yes. Appreciate yeah. what we're seeing from this guy because it is stunning. Now, speaking of stunning, Michael Schwab had a stat on pitching for the Astros, which I think is fascinating. Basically, mm -hmm. what he did is he showed the team ERA, starter ERA, bullpen ERA, and the starters inning pitched for 2023 and for 2022. And the difference is marginal. Like, the team ERA mm -hmm. is 332 this year. It was 301 last year. Starters ERA 331. Last year, 320. Bullpen, 335, last year, 273. Number of innings pitched for starters, 209. Last year at that, this time, that one 202. surprised me. Right, 202. And this is the other perspective. The Astros don't have four of their starters from 2022. The colors, your Keaty Garcia or Justin Verlander. And they've got two rookies in Hunter Brown and JP France pitching. And they've still gone more innings than last year. I mean, that's a, I don't know what to say about that other than my goodness their pitching uh their pitching staff coaching has got to I mean it's off the charts. Look at what they're doing. Yeah, yeah it, it, and what surprises me is a guy like JP France getting into that 5th or 6th inning because in the minor leagues they're not taxing those guys. Right. They're piggybacking them because they've got, you know, five or six starters down there. They all want them to get starts, but they also want to get innings and and uh, pitch numbers up. But at the same time, you know, you're limited to 85 total pitches. You're only pitching five innings. You know, there's some limitations in the minor leagues. So I appreciate what JP France has actually done because coming out of the minor leagues and, you know, five or six starts, he wasn't really stretched out to the extent, but yet he's been hyper efficient getting into the sixth inning. Uh, against the Chicago White Sox, going a solid five after you know a rough inning, uh, first inning in Seattle. So I really appreciate what they're doing. But at the same time, it's amazing to know that the expectation for an Astros starter mm -hmm. is to go six minimum. That's the mentality when you dig into the rubber that first inning of a ball game is I am going six. And that's where I think Josh Miller de deserves a little credit. Bill Murphy out there in the bullpen. Mm -hmm. Those guys deserve a lot of credit for creating that mentality and creating that opportunity and creating that expectation that in this modern day of analytics doesn't lend itself to extended outings for starters like that. 
Yeah, it's just been really impressive to see how the Astros just how they grind it. You know, I mean, like they they leave their guys out there. Um, you know, it's pretty rare to see somebody come out there and say, "Okay, you're getting drilled." You know, sometimes you just got to. Mm-hmm. It, it feels like you've just got to take one. You know, if you're getting you, hit you around, will, you will learn how to be poised in those situations, or you will be let go or sent down. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's the fight or flight and these guys are fighting like crazy. It's a, it's a fascinating to look at those stats though. And to see like how close they were compared to last year. I, I think one of the difficult things in baseball and, and is that it is so long. The season is so long and there's so many at bats and so many pitches. And so mm-hmm. there is a, there's a recency bias that happens probably more so in in baseball than in anything else like with football for example everything's concentrated in every single week so yeah. you sp- and then you spend a whole week breaking it down and talking about it with baseball like one bad play you can't really think or talk about it for very long because you got another game the next day and you just keep moving but for fans you know I, I was telling my buddy, like I told you the other day, my buddy likes to refer to Ryan Presley as Ryan Stressley. And um, <laughs> and he he is he, he's of the mind that that Presley, you know, just shouldn't be the closer. And I'm like, yeah, but look at his numbers. I mean, look at how good he's been. Does he occasionally be low slave? Yeah. Doesn't everybody? Yeah. Like he's not Mariano Rivera in his prime, but that's who he is. You know, so seriously, when you find him, (laughs) sign him up. Exactly. So it's just, it's hard though, because when you're watching in baseball, it's just so many games and just so like the, 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 the constant, like, you know, pressure of all of that is just, it's Mm -hmm. overwhelming and it's hard to be patient. Well, it's hard to be patient and then you can dig yourself a hole in a hurry too, because yeah. you are playing every day. You know, you, you can turn an over four into an over 20 in about, you know, six or seven games. And all of a sudden you're going, man, I got a hole to dig out of. Or if you're a reliever, you give up that one, two spot or three spot in an inning. And all of a sudden you see your ERA jump like a Rafael Montero. And you're looking at the rest of the season going, damn, I got to, I got to go out there and go shutty the rest of the way to get my numbers down to where I want them. Right. Uh, but I also think there is a benefit to knowing that you know if you do have a blow up game you have a little bit shorter term memory because you've got to turn right around and prepare for that next start yeah or that next at bat or that next game so you know it's kind of interesting but yeah when you compare you know a 162 game season to an 18 game season uh you know every every one nfl game is nine major league baseball games <laughs> if wow, you think about that's it unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> it's like three series yeah that's exactly crazy. Man. Do you let me ask you this, Blumer? Do, like, how much do guys? I mean, I'm sure obviously it's different for everybody, but like, how much do guys look at those numbers and think things like that? Like, sh- crap, I've got to get these numbers. But I mean, do guys think about that much? Um, I, I, no, not in the big term, like in the big, you know, not mm-hmm. th- they don't look at it from that 40,000, you know, foot level. They look a little right. bit lower, you know, one of the best pieces of advice I got from somebody was just take it every, every you know, go every 10 at bats, you know, cause then you're thinking, Oh, I just got to get three hits, you know, and it kind of, it kind of limits the, the kind of limits the imagination of man if i don't get those three hits what do i do but you have 10 at bats to go out there and get three three hits and if you get two you're hitting 200 what do i do the next 10 go out there and get a couple more i'll be all right so you try and limit it i know a lot of guys used to look at it monthly they would give themselves i want to hit three to five home runs i want to drive in so many runs and then all of a sudden you kind of said okay that month's over what do i have to do next month and let's go out there and try and attack it that way but once you start looking at Man, I'm only hitting two, you know, two hundred right now. That means I've got to, you know, you start doing big math. That's when you got big problems. <laughs> I can imagine. I just think it's it's a it's a wild the kind of pressure that comes along with that kind of stuff. And and yeah, I think that you know, uh, looking at it every few, it's one of the it's one of the very few uh, professions of any kind, never mind sports or anything else, where thirty percent success rate is considered like elite. <laughs> Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just that's just unbelievable. So uh, last thing before we go, we got the Cubs for a couple more games. I will be at the ballpark tonight taking in the the doing a doing my usual taking in of the game and trying to uh, 
assess what's happening. I don't know what the hell I'm going to find out uh, that anybody else will, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. We'll give it a shot. Um, and then the A's. So the Astros do have a chance to like, you know, make up a little bit of ground here. Uh, you don't ever want to put the, you know, count your chickens as they say, but mm-hmm. I mean, this is probably the right time for them to start making a little bit of a move if they were going to do it. Um, and then maybe get Altuve back next week. And, you know, who knows? Yeah, TK and I talked about, uh, you know, I think it was that last game on the road trip where they were one game above 500. And mm-hmm. I don't know if it's 500 fatigue or what, but just the two of us were just kind of like, man, can we get past this 500 mark and not think about it anymore? Right. You know, they were, you know, they were like 20 and 19 and we're like, man, this is, this team's too good to be at 500 right now. Mm-hmm. And, and we know they're, they're beat up. There's injuries, maybe some tough competition at the end of April, but this is definitely a spot, you know, finishing with the Chicago White Sox, taking two out of three from them was a good thing. Cause that's a, that's a team in complete turmoil. They really are. And then you have the Cubs coming in who maybe, overachieved early in the in the year now i believe they're they've lost 15 of their last 20 or something like that so they're kind of reeling a little bit it's good timing to go beat up on them and then you have the oakland a's so this homestand is a real opportunity like you're pointing out for them to get six (laughs) selfishly i want them to be six or seven (laughs) games above 500 same yeah, because this is—I think that's the expectation. You can't go into that as a ball player, but you and I not playing now, we look at this and we're going, "Dude, this is—you got to go out and beat these teams." They know that internally, but at the same time, you have to go out and do it. So you can't go out there and say, "Oh, we're going to win this ball game." You got to go out there, pad your stats, get your yeah. numbers, pound on some—you know—get your pound of flesh from the Oakland A's yeah. and bury these guys and get up there against the Texas Rangers and say, "We're here again." It, you know, this is the American League West, and we're the Houston Astros. We're here again, and we'll be yeah. ready to go out there and play for you. But it would be a real confidence boost. It'd be a stat boost, and obviously, it'd put a lot of us uh, behind microphones at ease talking about this team. No doubt. And I tell you what, I don't the, the Las Vegas A's. Pardon me. So I'll just go ahead and shoot that out there. But we need, I, like, we need to talk about that a little bit more. God, someday it's yeah. We're going to bring that up on a future podcast because. The crazy thing about the the Vegas thing is how ridiculously weird the whole process is. Like the whole Every, thing is everything just, about it. <clears throat> everything. I'm, I'm the more I more I think about it, the more I'm like, what the hell is going on? So I mean, yeah, the, I'm just, they're like, sorry. we're gonna b- build it here. No, we're gonna build it here. Oh, we d- we need five hundred million from the city. No, we just need three hundred and fifty million. Just three hundred and fifty million from the city. It's ridiculous. But you're going to build a billion and a half dollar stadium or whatever it is for a payroll of thirty five million. Hmm. I don't. I don't like, there's certain things where I'm going. Okay, it makes sense for the A's to to move, but at the same time, I'm so ingrained in Oakland with this team and this the history of the franchise. Right. But then I'm looking at Las Vegas, who you know there were questions on whether or not they'd make a hockey team work, and they're one of the one of the best franchises yeah. in the league now. But I'm going is is Vegas looking at the A's and going, yeah, we got our we got our franchise. <laughs> I mean, I can't imagine. I don't know what's wrong with the owner. I just hope it's not a blown spootinator. That's what I think <laughs> might be wrong. <laughs> That's what's wrong. That, might, that might be what's wrong with the owner. Uh, the owner yeah. might have a blown spootinator. Completely. It's, oh you my god! Don't want to have a blown spootinator. It's not good for anybody. It's not good for anybody. I yeah. I, we're going to definitely talk about that. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more on Friday um, when we because I I just I feel like I need to dig into that a little bit because <clears throat> I I so for a while I did spend some time dealing with arenas and stadiums and stuff. Yeah. I have more knowledge about that than I'd care to want to you know than I really want, frankly. Um, and I just like viewing this from from this distance. It is some of the weirdest and most bizarre stuff I've ever seen. Because first of all, the numbers are outrageous. I mean, the numbers yeah. are insane. A billion dollars for a stadium complex in a, in Vegas is just insane. And then just like when you look at what we've done here in Houston, you know, we spent the, the most expensive stadium was NRG. Right. Mm -hmm. It was four hundred and fifty million dollars, roughly. It was I mean, how it was done was not great. But the other stadiums, you look at Minute Maid, 
under $200 million built. Renovations on it, about $150 million since then. You've got Toyota Center, cost about $235 million to build. They're working on renovations for that, probably $7,500 $100 million dollar worth of renovations that are going into that. You've got the Dynamo Stadium, which is a super cool facility, yeah, um, much less. All of these mo- money coming from hotel occupancy and car rental taxes, which in Houston is great because we're not a tourist city. So most of the people mm-hmm. who come here and do that are um, people coming for conventions or for business and things like that. So that all just gets written into those costs. But a place like Vegas, where are they going to get the money from? You're going to suddenly start taxing people more Mm -hmm. in Vegas for, I don't know. Again, I'm going to leave it because I I'll just roll on. I'll just rampage on. I'm still curious if baseball is going to work in Vegas. Well, certainly we don't even know if football a transitory city that has to, a transitory city that has to supply 81 games, you know, in hockey, what there are 40 games you know, uh, and then football, you have <clears throat> nine to 10. Right. You know, and by so, the way, I mean, yeah. let's not forget, you've got to, you've got to send a bunch of people to a stadium that many times, 80 games in the dead of summer in Vegas. Mm-hmm. Like if football's fall That's and a winter point. in the yeah. dead of, so I don't care if people are driving or whatever. I don't care if you've turned that, uh, entire stadium into a f- meat locker. If you're asking me to go out in a hundred and five degree heat to go to a baseball game, just walking across the parking lot is going to be a challenge for some people. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know what they, they're going to have to build the biggest underground parking lot that's ever existed. I know. And at the, but at the same time, the triple a team in Vegas is outdrawing the big league team. Is it really? <laughs> I think they announced, uh, you know, 2,500 fans at uh, last night's game in Oakland, which is, I, I can't even, it makes no sense. 2,500? It was something crazy. I'd have to look it up, but it was in the 2000s. I don't, that, that's, that's terrible. 2,500. And I feel terrible for those players too. I mean, my goodness, like. There's no way to get motivated. No. What are you going to do? I, Just go out. Yeah. So, I mean. I have experience in that. I played in Montreal. I, right. I was on contraction phone calls. I mean, it, I played in Montreal. You were were you you were there the year was it the year they were contracted or was it when did when did that happen? When, I was there. When did that my last year there was two thousand. Well, spring of two thousand two, but I was there ninety nine two thousand two thousand one, and uh, I was playing in front of five thousand fans in an eighty thousand oh. seat stadium. Ooh, that has got to be that has got to be painful. I mean, yeah. look as a, as a musician who's played some gigs in front of nobody. Let me tell you mm-hmm. something. Yeah, that's similar. There's there is nothing less motivating than playing to one drunk guy. I'm telling Man, you, it is a, it is a it is a punishment. Frankly, mm-hmm. it is just like at that point, you really do have to do whatever you're doing for yourself. You can't do it for anybody else. The whole every bit of motivation, every bit of desire has to come from within. There's, you can't draw anything from anybody else at that point. It really, no, I would imagine. Not, you're, you're, yeah, you're not playing externally. You're playing internally. Right. Separates the men from the boys on that one, I would imagine. Because if you're if you're good in that environment, if you go out there and you're able to be good in that environment, that says a lot about uh, about your character as a as an athlete. Because who Mm -hmm. I mean, and frankly, who could blame anyone if they weren't, (laughs) you know, if just went out there? I mean, I don't I can't say anything. Good Lord. All right. Well, Blummer, you're going to I'm sure I'll see you at the game this evening. Um, I look forward what is, to it. What is? Uh, do you have any? I just dropped my. I just dropped something. I jerked around like I was. Somebody Whoa. shocked me. Um, <laughs> I, dro- I dropped my wedding ring. It almost fell on the floor. I was pulling it off my oh. finger for a second because I had an itch. It was, I'm giving this explication about my ring, and it almost fell on the ground. <laughs> and I tried to catch it, and I looked like a crazy person. If you're watching this on YouTube, if you're not, now you've heard all about it, and please ignore me. <laughs> um, so, any final thoughts on the week coming up? Uh, uh, any anything good going? Bes- hey, what's happening outside of baseball? Are you going to play golf this week? You finally got some good weather. Yep, yep. No, I'll be playing. Uh, actually, we have a day off. Thir- Dude, if you're watching this on YouTube, check this out. Dear God, this <laughs> is this right here. Your heat this miser, right here bro. Needs to get- yeah, exactly. <laughs> I need to go to the chop shop. So my day off will be spent trying to figure out what to do with yeah. this this nest <laughs> and uh and once Blown i figure up. that out 
Yeah, you can laugh, dude. It's bad. Oh, no. Well, um, look, mine's not great. Mine's not great. I mean, this is not a, a really happy site either. Yeah, we're in a so bad place right now. I know. I got to get to my boy, Tom, to get my, get as my grandfather used to say, get my ears lowered. It's like, yep. <laughs> I got to yeah. get in there because, yeah, I'm with you. That's going to. And by the way, I've been thinking about, I need to ask you off air sometime. I'm thinking of there's a driving range real close to my house, and I've been thinking about just getting a driver and going out there and hitting balls for nothing whack more it. than just get just out there, pure and aggression, it. just yep. pure aggression, just get it out. It's like a, it's not even a mile from my house. It's like a little yep. tiny little place. They got it. All it is is like a open field with a trailer. You know, that's like there you go. Like, I was straight tin cup. Yeah, exactly. It's straight up 10 cup. Exactly. 100%. All right, guys. Thanks for being with us today. We will be back on Friday with a fresh pod brought to you by Bet Online. Huge thanks to all you listeners and viewers and who got to see our messy hair today. <laughs> um, it's, it's, look, it's pretty spectacular for both of us right now. Um, mm. Mine looks mine looks better than Robert Smith's from The Cure did when I saw them on Friday. But yeah, not that guy much. was looking a little rough, man. The thing is, he sounded so incredible, Blummer. I got to tell That's you, man. That's all that matters. I, he sounded an unbelievable. He looked like he had been dead for a week, but he sounded <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> so it's like, uh, so you guys are always great, liking and subscribing and commenting on everything. Super thankful for all of you. Keep it coming. Uh, have a great rest. And as always, go Astros. 